All right, so we're going to be talking about um, OS Moloch deployments. And Elise picked out this owl. I think it's appropriate or not. So we have three different types of networks that we monitor at OATH. We have Office, that's your employees and your VPNs. We have what we call CIC, which is your back office in a data center. So that might be where you have some ugly SAS or SAP or one of those things you don't like to talk about. And then we have production traffic. And we monitor all three. We monitor them in different ways, different retentions. Uh, and we'll talk about how we do that. And we have lots of offices. We have over 50 global offices. So it's, it's a big effort. If you want to talk about the effort, you can talk to Mark and Matt, who will tell you how fun it is. So what's the design? What are we doing here? Well, AOL and Yahoo and a bunch of other companies all came together to form Oath. All of them had different styles, different ways to do their visibility. And we tried to take the best of all of them and put them together. We got a chance to kind of start from scratch, which was really neat. Got to spend a lot, which is always well, really neat, a lot of fun. Our main go-to tools are Bro, Sericata, and Moloch. We put them all together on one box. And that one box, there could be several of them per data center or office or whatever. And we'll talk about that. But we have all three tools on one box, as opposed to some people do specialized boxes for each. Our main goal is to keep it easy, keep the number of boxes and the types of boxes consistent. And so instead of having specialized boxes, by putting everything on one box, we can do that. We use an NPB to load balance the traffic from our taps and span ports. We obviously use Arista for that, and we'll be talking about that. And for production, we have to reduce the traffic, because as you can imagine, some of our production load is very high. Oh, and just to make it clear, our goal for analyzing our production traffic is less than half. So we're, we're analyzing less than half of our production traffic, and we're actually storing a much smaller amount, too. And you'll see that later, but just keep that in the back of your head when you see these huge numbers. First of all, we, we slice that number like by 50% right from the start. And I'll go over how we do that. So what is an NPB, a network packet broker, for those who aren't familiar? It's going to aggregate, filter, and load balance the traffic from multiple taps, span ports, and then load balance that across to different tools. We use uh, <clears throat> two main styles of Aristas. We use pizza boxes, and there's, there's the 7150s and 7280s, which we use in our office and CIC locations. The main difference, as far as I'm concerned, they can tell you more, is that the 7280 has the 100 gig ports, which can be used for 40 gigs. So if you have need for that, you'll usually get the bigger box, although I think there might be some 7050s that have that too. But then the 7150s are mostly 10 gig. And then for production, we use the big box. And so why use an MPB? I like to talk about this because Lots of people in the Slack channel are always like, I don't want to use MPB. I don't want to spend the money, blah, 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 blah. You, you should use one. It will save you so much time in the long run, it's so much work. There are lots of vendors out there that do it. They're specialized vendors. For you, that's all they do. And the specialized vendors will have more features in their NPB, like the Gigamons. Uh, can you remember what Ixia is called these days? But still Ixia, but Keynote, but blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, they keep changing their name. But um, they will have some extra features, like the most prevalent is uh, packet dedupe, if you need that. And here at uh, Oath, we do actually use some Ixia for some things where we need to do packet de uh, dedupes. But for this particular application, we're using the Aristas. And there's other vendors, too, that have uh, a network packet broker. So there's all kinds of things out there. The Aristas, for what we're doing, are a little bit cheaper, usually. But why do you want one? The main reason to get one is it separates you from your network team. And everybody loves to have good relationships with their network team, but sometimes you don't. And so what you do is you put the box in the middle. The network team gets to plug their wires into their side. The security team gets to plug their wires into the other side. And they don't have to really talk to each other other than to make sure there's enough ports on the MPB to handle both people, right? both groups. And you can, it can be, it's much easier to be friendly with your network team when you have that box in the middle. It also means like as they want to run new um, links, 
they can do it whenever they want. They can just plug the link in, and it's all going to pretty much magically work, which is great. You don't have to be involved with their schedule, as long as you have enough ports. So you should overbuy ports is, is something important, just so that you have that capacity when they want to add links. And, and usually what happens is they'll tell you two days before, hey, we're adding you know, 10 new links. And you're like, oh, thanks for giving us warning. But if you have the NPB, you have some spare ports, there's no issue there. And what does the NPV do for you? Well, it's going to, like we talked about, it's going to filter it. You're moving your filtering from uh, a host with BPF filters to specialized hardware with the ability to filter the hard, uh, traffic much faster. Blah, blah, blah. What else did I miss? Oh, HA issues. So if you have a, a data center, for example, you'll probably have HA pairs of firewalls or routers. If you send all the links to the NPV, the single NPV, that NPV will make sure that it load balances symmetrically to your tool ports, so you don't have to worry. Have I sold you guys? Anybody not sold yet? Get an NPB, even if it's not the Arista, get one. It will make your life easier. So visibility hosts, what did we do for the visibility hosts, and how did we select them? Well, we knew Bro was going to be a memory and CPU hog, especially in our um, production deployments. So we had to make sure we took that into account. We're using AF Packet for everything. That means for Bro, you have to do a specialized patch that luckily someone figured out so we compile Bro ourselves. We want enough memory so that eventually we could run other tools, including uh, some malware analysis and other stuff that uses a lot of memory. And we wanted to use smaller boxes because SiteOps usually likes the smaller boxes. The only problem with them is the smaller boxes are usually deeper. So when you buy the smaller box, even though it's only 2RU, it's usually um, anywhere from three to nine inches deeper. So you do need to make sure you, you talk to your SiteUps people if you go with the smaller boxes that their racks can handle the deeper boxes. So how, or what hardware did we actually select? So like I mentioned before, we want minimum configurations. So we basically have two configurations for both of our systems, visibility and Moloch ES. So visibility, we went with these super micros. When we were formerly AOL, we actually did HPs. The HPs, because you get that H and the P on it, cost a lot more than the super micros. But we are, they're basically the same box for Office versus Prod, except the bigger disk and more memory. For our Elasticsearch boxes, we went with older boxes because they were basically free. The only thing we had to pay for was the hard drives. So we took all these older boxes that were sitting around, a lot of them, and shoved new hard drives into them. So we have two different architectures for Office and CIC. We're using, I believe they're Juniper. We're just getting span ports off of them. They're going to go into our Arista 7150 usually. And then they go over to our super micros. And this is what our super micros look like. If you've never seen one, it has two, uh, I don't know what you call it, places for drives. It's not my favorite design. Because in order to get to those middle drives, you have to either pull it out or do something. And I think there's even screws. And I'm sure when your side ops people cabled them, they didn't leave the cables long enough. And you're not going to be able to hot swap. So when you want the failure, you want it in the front. So you tell them, only hit the front ones with the hammer and not the middle ones. And then you're OK. The HPs actually have a cool system where you pulled it out and you can get to the, the drives. So that extra money for the H and the P also gets you this cool feature where to get to the second row of drives, the, the whole thing is like on, I don't know what to call it, rails, its own rails, where just the front set of drives comes out, and then you can reach in and get to the back set of drives. So most of our sites, office sites, only have one or two visibility boxes. We went with the Arista anywhere, everywhere, just because it makes everything consistent, even if you don't necessarily need it. Production architecture is tap-based, so optical tap-based. We're using Etsia taps for that. You have whatever you're tapping goes through your optical tap. Remember, every link you tap actually needs two ports on your MPV because it's sending the um, receive and transmit separately because it's an optical tap. And so we send it to our, our big Arista, and it's going to send it to our visibility boxes. And, and in our production data centers, we have anywhere from five to over 50 visibility boxes set up. And then for, I'm sorry, I missed this. For our office deployment, we have a centralized Elasticsearch cluster. 
So all of our 50 plus global offices send their Elasticsearch data, their spy data to a central location. While in our production and our CIC, we have the Elasticsearch boxes co-located. Co Usually what we do is our visibility boxes are actually in the network row and right next to or near the MPB where our um, Elasticsearch boxes live on the data, uh, data center floor. That's not a requirement, but that's, that's just what we do. So in reality, what does it look like when you look at the back of one of these? Well, so here's, this one was being set up. It's not fully set up, but these top three are your 100 gig ports. Bottom two are the 48 gig ports. So these are all um, taps coming in. These are all the tools going out. So we have 40 gig and 100 gigs coming in and 10 gigs going out. And then this is what an office might look like. This office has, I can't add, but probably eight visibility servers. And here's the, the links coming in. This is one actually where the, the office is 40 gig based. And so that's why this is over here to the side. These are the 40 gig links. I don't know anything about switches really, but I think when they're in MPB mode, so the Arista is like in normal switch mode, whatever that means, and then it's an MPB mode. And when it's an MPB mode, the supports you're not using turn colors, which makes it look like a Christmas tree, I guess. Everything is lit up. So that means that these are not being used and not configured, which you can just look at it and see it's not being used. But that's what they, <laughs> I don't know why they do that, but it's all lit up. I think in normal switch mode, it doesn't do that, right? It's the opposite. I, whatever. That's the owl's confused too, why it's so pretty. So definitely, depending on what vendor and just how you treat your hard drives, you pay attention to your replication level, especially when you're doing your scaling. If you're upgraded to Elasticsearch 6, use 642 and not 624. 624 has some weird issues with replication where sometimes the replication gets messed up. 642, that's fixed. Security, use IP tables. I've talked to lots of people who do not use IP tables with Elasticsearch. Please use IP tables. Or if you're paying money, use XPAC or whatever, but use that something to secure it. Don't have it open on your internal net, because if it's open on your internal net, if anybody gets onto your internal net, then they can see everything in your Elasticsearch. And the other thing you also have to watch is the number of your ACLs that your MVB can handle if you're gonna do a lot of traffic reduction. Okay, how are you? We're almost to the exciting part. So sizing. For Office, we did sizing based on the number of employees. We happen to know it's about 250 employees for our use case and our employees and how our employees use the internet per box. And so that's what we do. So like a building like, uh, or sorry, a campus like this with, I don't remember how we have, let's pretend it's 1,200 employees. You're like, oh, we need six boxes or eight boxes or whatever the math works out. And that's how many boxes we get. And for smaller sites that only may have 30 employees, instead of buying, a specialized uh, box, we still use the same box everywhere, and that particular site might have two or four times the retention than, than is required by our standards, but it's easier than having multiple boxes, I mean, multiple configurations. And then for production, we do all our sizing based on gigabits per second. Yay, okay, let's see if I can do this. So here's two example sites. These numbers are not real. We have our inputs on the bottom, which are fairly close to being real. And so we, we do have this spreadsheet, and this is what we actually use. Like, so we, we think about how, much, how many days we want to keep our Elasticsearch. So for production, like let's say 28 days, we have each machine has 30 terabytes of usable disk. How much we want, how much we think each visibility box can actually handle. So we're saying four gigabits per second is the max. This is how much of the traffic we're writing to disk. So we're gonna to write to disk at most, like around 15%. How much each visibility box has, about 230 terabytes usable. How many days we wanna store PCAP for, 14. And how much this TLS traffic. This is the hardest one to understand. So, okay, we have 100% of our traffic. We're gonna be dropping some. In this example, we're going to be dropping 55% at the NPB. That means 45% of the traffic is going to be making it to the visibility boxes. That 45%, and this is kind of uh, misnamed, it's going to be split 
where of that 45%, 15% of it is going to be written to disk, and 30% of it we're only analyzing. We're not writing to disk. We're still looking at it, but we're not writing it to disk. Does that make sense? OK, so here we go. So these are made up. We have three sites, production one, production two. That's how many links it has. It's giving 500 gigabits per second on average. So using these numbers down here, we can calculate how much we're going to have to store to disk per second and how much we're going to analyze per second, which allows us to calculate how many hosts we need based on PCAP and how many hosts we need based on gigabits per second. So the PCAP number is the PCAP days divided by the disk space divided by the PCAP gigabits per second. So the gigabits per second is you got to add these two together times the ES, oh, sorry, add these two together divided by gigabits per host. And so you get two different numbers, and then you take the max, and that's how many hosts you actually need. And so on the CIC side, you can see it's based on host uh, PCAP because we have different PCAP requirements for CIC, where for production, it's the host gigabits per second that's going to be the higher number. And as you change these numbers in the spreadsheet, it's going to fool with these. And so that's how we get the number of visibility hosts we need per site. Good? Did I lose anybody yet? Sweet. OK, how much Elasticsearch do we need? So again, it's the same formula, the type of formula. We, we have these two numbers that we're adding together times the Elasticsearch days. So we want to store at least 28 days worth of things times our magic com uh, conversion number that we've just gotten from experience. And this is the same number that the uh, estimators page uses, if you've ever used our estimators page. And that calculates how much uh, Elasticsearch terabytes we need. And then to get the number of hosts, you just take the number of um, the amount of disk and divide that into there, and that gets you the hosts. And what we found is that the number of visibility hosts, at least of this size, and the number of Elasticsearch hosts are almost, they're very similar. They're, they're close. And um, there's probably a simple formula that you could just apply, but I haven't figured it's too lazy. You just divide by 1.2, maybe. But this way, we have all the math. Make sense? Awesome. So now we get to the fun part, right? How much does that actually cost? These numbers are all made up. Don't worry, Alan. <laughs> Don't go to Alan and say, Andy said it's only going to cost forty thousand dollars. <laughs> I actually have no much. I don't. I don't know how much it costs. But let's just pretend. So this is a ten gig line card, a hundred gig line card. The chassis that it all fits into, visibility host, Elasticsearch host, and the NPB and the CIC is just different. It's, it's just a more expensive box. It's thirty k. And so we're back. To, the same thing where we have our numbers. So in production site one, we have 20 100 gig links and four 40 gig links. Here's the hosts that we had. We can calculate how many line cards we need of each type. And you can use the 100 gig cards for 40 gig. That's usually the way, easier way to go, unless you have lots of 40 gig links. It's usually better just to use your 100 gig card, in my opinion. Why are we multiplying by two here? Who was paying attention? Very good. Transmit and receive. So every time there's a link, you actually have to multiply by two. You divide by 36 because that's the number of ports on the 100 gig, and 48 because that's the number of ports on the 10 gig. And you can calculate how many cards you need. What we actually do, and I didn't do here, is we divide by a lower number so that we have pairs. So you might divide by 30 or 26 or whatever. And that way, you have spares per card. So when your network team, as we talked about before, decides, I'm going to add a lot more links, you're ready for it. And your network team is always going to add at least two links at a time, right? because they're all about HA. And those two links at a time are going to each need two ports. So your network team is always going to come to you and say, we need four more ports, always, at minimum. So you always should leave four empty. You could just do a minus four at the end and whatever. So then we get to the costing. This is obviously all in thousands. It would be nice if it wasn't. Um, and this is, this is fairly accurate ratio-wise. And so we come with the spreadsheet. We go through this long process of getting approvals. And like this is how 
we get um, all our numbers and we can go through this with our uh, purchasing folks and they're like, okay. So here's our, our real costs. Not can't show you the numbers, but for those who are interested, this is how we spent our money. I didn't show you the taps. The taps are relatively cheap compared to everything else. So we just add them into our MPB costs. But you can see if you go down, we spent the most money on our visibility boxes, almost 60 percent is spent on visibility boxes, and almost 65 percent is spent on our um, production traffic if you go that direction. Make sense? Sweet. So how do we reduce traffic in production? So in the MPB, at least with the Arista, your, your only option is really to drop based on IP and port, and or port. So what we do is we actually have a Perl script that generates all of our drops using our database, our CMDB database, your, your ops database that has all your machines listed in it. And I'll show you how that works. And so that's going to do that first pass where we're dropping about 55% of our traffic in production right from the start. What kind of traffic do we drop? We come up with things that we know, for whatever reason, we don't want to look at. So let's say we never want to look at consumer SMTP traffic because we run a large mail service. And there's already a million other things looking at the SMTP traffic. We can just drop all of the SMTP servers and say, we never want to look at that traffic. You can also drop other things based on whatever you want. And then we use Moloch rules to drop a lot of traffic. And the three biggies is you only save the first little bit of your TLS sessions. You only save the handshake so that you have the certificate. The rest of the traffic, unless you're doing after the fact breaking, is useless. We don't save SIN scans. Where we are in our um, network, is we see everything that hits us. Like even if it doesn't make it past the firewalls or the routers, we still see it. So there's no reason to watch everybody attack just simple SIN scans, which are constant. And then we have examples where you might not save ad network traffic or other things. And so I'll go into the examples here. So here's the example. Like we have a simple script. These first three lines are what the input looks like. Basically we say, we have a file of uh, we have a file of all the mail hosts at Yahoo. It goes through that file and it looks for anything that starts with SMTP to port 25, and it will output these ACLs that get loaded or access lists. I'm still confused what the difference is, but it's some magic. Same with mail. With, we have an IMAP server that we don't want to watch the traffic for. This one we just enter it. And the script does um, DNS lookups to find all the IP addresses behind it. And then we can run the script every day, or however often you want. And it will go generate the, what to drop and upload it to the, M the MPB. And it uses the configuration session stuff so that it's very it's fairly quick. You know, it's uploading this huge file. And then it does a commit at the end of the changes. And then the, M the MPB does the delta of what's changing from the previous load. Okay, the next, so that's what we do for the MPB. And then for Moloch, we use rules. And here's, I'm going to give an example of the three rules. These are on the wiki, I think, but this is the best one, just dropping TLS. You see TLS, only save the first 10 packets, is what this says. You only save a tiny little, tiny little bit of the packets to disk. This helps in two ways. It makes the session that it sends to Elasticsearch a lot smaller because it doesn't have to save the index of every single packet. It's only going to send the index for the first 10 packets to Elasticsearch. So your session size you're sending to Elasticsearch is going to be much smaller. And then it doesn't use your uh, disk from the visibility. It's only going to save the first 10 packets to the disk. Thin scans, similar. This will not save the spy data to Elasticsearch. So it's still going to write the single packet to disk. It's a small packet because it's only a thin scan but it's not going to send a session to Elasticsearch. And any session you can not send to Elasticsearch is great because Elasticsearch doesn't have to index it. Like the, all the amount of data that's going to send to Elasticsearch to index is bigger than the one packet that went by. And then this one is the most complicated to explain, so I, I will try my best. But basically, you have hosts that 
You have hosts that your internal systems are reaching out to that live on the cloud, is what this example is using. And when you have hosts that work that way, their IPs can change constantly, right? So add that double click, running on Google Cloud, let's pretend. And so its IPs are gonna change constantly. And so when you're reaching out to it, you can't block it, block it based on IP in the NPB, because it's gonna change, you don't know how fast it's gonna change. So instead, MOA can keep track of it, and you can actually set how often to allow it to change. And so in this case, it's 10 minutes. It could be, you could set it to much smaller. But what it's gonna do, as traffic goes by, to add that double click, it's gonna keep track of the destination IP and track it for 10 minutes. And for 10 minutes, any traffic that goes to that IP, from then on, on port, or that's a protocol 80, sorry, that's protocol TLS, it's gonna drop. And it's going to keep track of that. And it actually keeps track of that and writes it to file. So that if Moloch Capture restarts, it will still be there. And it keeps in the file, it keeps the date. So if it does restart, it will know still when to age it out. And so if you have hosts that are reaching out, to, in this case, food.example.com, and that lives in AWS, and it could change at any time, it's going to keep track of those IPs and start dropping the, the traffic to those. It's also going to drop the traffic to these very early in the whole packet pipeline of Moloch. So it's gonna really reduce your CPU. And so what we found is some of these ad networks, and we're, we're an ad network, so we make a lot of calls to different ad networks. It's great to drop it early, because it allows us not to save it to disk, makes Moloch faster, and it makes Elasticsearch happy. Does that make sense? Okay. This is from the wiki, but other important high performance settings you got to turn off lib file. Lib file is very slow. It will destroy your Moloch. If you, we have what's called basic mode, where a Moloch has built in around 50 to 60 of the most common uh, lib file type things. And so it's very fast. But it won't get those random things that like lib file will have. So that's the one downfall. But it'll get the most common ones. you got to enable AF packet. You gotta increase your threads for uh, AF packet if you need it. And you gotta set your packet threads. Now, everybody seems to always go, packet threads can go to 24. I'm gonna go to 24 right from the start. Going to 24 right from the start is actually the worst thing you could do. It's actually gonna make everything run slower. It's gonna make Moloch run slower. It's, it's totally the wrong thing to do. What you should do is start with a low number and just slowly increase it until things work the way you want. By going to the really high number right from the beginning, what you're doing is you're causing all these threads to be created. You're causing all this uh, memory traffic inside the machine. Not good. And then I threw in PCAP encryption at rest because that's something like we do. I definitely recommend folks do some kind of encryption with Moloch. There's two common ways. You can either do disk encryption, which is fine and dandy if you like to do that or you can use Moloch encryption to do it. The big difference is if you're doing disk encryption, obviously if someone is on your box, then they can read the disk. Which is, if, you're, if that's good enough, then disk encryption sometimes is easier to set up. Moloch encryption is just some configuration, and what it's doing is the PCAP file is, actually, is encrypted with its own encryption key. That encryption key is encrypted with a key encryption key that's set up to Elasticsearch and stored, and each file has its own encryption key and so that way, if you get on the box, you, can't, you still can't just read the PCAP files. You actually have to go decrypt it. So that's the big difference between the two. There's a big downfall, though, in that if you want to operate on the files as PCAP files, you can no longer do that. So you can no longer just say Wireshark or T-Dump or T-Shark on the file because it's now encrypted. Where if you use disk encryption, you could. So pros and cons to both. Either way, please look at using some kind of PCAP encryption at disk, at rest. Who's, who's using that? Who's using some kind of PCAP? Oh, no one, no one. No one's encrypting their PCAP. Oh, one. Uh, well, then I'm glad I mentioned it. So if you do the Moloch one, you can turn on and off at any time. And you can do it different on different nodes. You can do whatever you want. One other thing I just wanted to mention about 1.6, 
we finally added a db.pl backup command that backs up all of the indices except for the session indices. Should have done this a long time ago. I'm going to probably backport it when I backport your uh, that feature you want that we don't talk about. Any questions? Hello, uh, regarding data regarding data encryption. <laughs> Whoa. Um, ha have you benchmarked? Um, so, I mean, most operating systems it's transparent if you do full disk encryption effectively right now. Um, I'd imagine there's there's a hit on the application to do it um, the, the way you have it configured. Do you do any benchmarking on that, sir? No, we have not done any benchmarking. Um, question? I don't know. I mean, we haven't noticed any issues, so we'll start with that. Hey, hey. When you're doing upgrades, what's the best practice in terms of with your volume, right? How long does it take for you to re-index, you know, stuff like that? So we're already on one six for all of these, so we didn't. Last, uh, sorry, um, Moloch one six, so we didn't have to re-index for these clusters. For some of our old clusters, we did do the re-index, and I think it took four to five weeks, like like Matt had, to make it through all our data. Okay. And not, and not crush elastic. Yes, the more you have, the longer it takes. Hello. You just got to do it. You just got to say, I'm going to do it. We do, we, we do have a, a packet broker. Um, and uh, currently, we, we lo manually load balance our, Mola, uh, our, our viewers. But it's it's still somewhat uh, unbalanced, so we're we're considering doing load balanced, and then I, I think it's it's uh, session based and based on five tuples. But um, do you have any advice on load balancing with the to to the viewers with the packet broker, or is it pretty straightforward? Right. So the, you mean from your traffic from the taps to the capture boxes? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. The yes. Yeah. So if uh, I mean most. Most MPBs have a mode where you do have to set it. You have to go look it up for your, your particular version. Have a mode where it says symmetric. You have to turn on symmetric load balancing, because by default, it will probably do asymmetric, which is bad. And then you get to set what fields you want. And you want to make sure you turn off VLAN and turn off VRE and only do the five tuple. Got it. OK. Right. So if you leave the VLAN on, some crazy networks have different VLANs depending on the direction you're going. I don't understand how that works, but it's magic. And then sometimes you have different um, uh, tunnels, protocols, and stuff. You have to turn all that off for the load balancing part. You only want the five tuple. OK, thank you. And symmetric. Symmetric is very important. So, so it sounds like upgrades are a bit of a headache for a lot of people with large installations. It sounds like you have a really large installation. It sounds like your your most people's options are along the lines of uh, a let it reindex and take a while and, and the challenges there. Option B might be to start up a new cluster altogether and just kind of age out the old one depending on how long your retention is, and then maybe try to recycle hardware. Maybe option C uh, throw on a whole bunch of extra Elasticsearch uh, nodes temporarily. During the reindexing for a short period of time, or something along the lines. Do you, do you does your team you know have you evaluated like uh, which way you've done the upgrades and, and thoughts on any of those or so, or I mean, other options? Maybe I answered the question wrong before. Upgrading in general is seamless. You just run the db.pl and it's pretty instantaneous. The only upgrade that's uh, really painful is prior to 1.0 to 1.0. Like we we required a reindexing for that particular upgrade. So yes, those who are stuck. 4.10 and want to get past 1.0, those are your options. We chose to bite the bullet and just, just do it. Because once you do it, the upgrade itself doesn't mean you're down. What happens is you're, you're turning a switch, and two things happen. When you turn the switch, all of the new indices that are written from then on are of the new format. And what's at, the re-indexing is just re-indexing old sessions. And so basically what it means is you can't access that old data until the reindexing finishes for that particular day. And so what you can do is 
if, if you have an incident or something on a certain day, you can just go to that day and only re-index that one day first and get that one over with. By default, what it does is it works backwards, thinking that you're going to want to look at the most um, recent data first, and so it slowly works backwards. I mean, they were talking about how what they do is do it in chunks of, I can't remember, 10 days or something like that at a time. That, that works too, I mean, however you want. But this is, again, only if you're stuck with pre-1.0. Um, 